Morbidity. My name is Faith Matcham. I'm going to be chairing. Uh, we have three really interesting presenters. Um, unfortunately, one has dropped out, so we'll have three, which means a bit more time. I think each talk can have 15 minutes. And then we'll have questions as a, as a group discussion at the end. The discussion will be led by my colleague, Alex. Um, so 15 minutes, we'll start with our first presentation by Mark Ashworth on the unequal journey to multimorbidity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And this is a session on multimorbidity. And I'm going to be talking about multimorbidity. Now, everything that I say about multimorbidity is derived uh, from a population database based here in Lambeth. We, ex we expect eventually to get data from Southwark, but at the moment, everything that I present will be Lambeth data. And I just need to take you through a bit of background about the data itself. The data comes from something called Lambeth DataNet, which is very much a community asset it has been developed over the last 10 years. It started with a GP called Richard Williams in Brixton who said there's huge inequalities here in Brixton, but I haven't got the data to prove it. How do I get the data? So what we devised collectively as GPs in Lambeth was a pseudonymized data set, that is data without any identifiers, so that we could then look at all the data that GPs, that GPs use on their GP systems with electronic health records. And there's a richness of data there about the social deprivation of patients, about the ethnicity of patients, about health inequalities related to those two specific inequalities, and also about their multimorbidity. Now, in fact, We've got data on 395,000 people, 320,000 of them are aged over 18 years. And the ethnicity we da data we've got is, well, it ought to be great data based on the national censuses, 2001, 2011. In fact, it tends more to be self-ascribed ethnicity, loosely arranged around the national census categories of 5 plus 1 and the more detailed 18 plus 1 classification. Now, we've looked at long-term conditions, and I'm going to show you a slide on long-term conditions and a slide on risk factors. And that's what my talk's going to revolve around, the, risk, the inequalities in both this slide, long-term conditions, and subsequently what I'm going to show you about the risk factors. So which long-term conditions did we include? We included 12 long-term conditions. This is not the only definition of multimorbidity. In fact, there's multiple definitions of multimorbidity, but it's one that fitted the purposes of this study. And although I'd left it to the last slide to talk about the funding of the study, I think it's actually very relevant to bring it in here. The funding was from the guys in St. Thomas's charity who wanted to invest in the study of multimorbidity, but also to look at the causes of multimorbidity and how you might be able to prevent it. Also, to home in on where, where multimorbidity hits hardest in terms of inequalities. And it was partly driven for that reason that this definition of multimorbidity focused on preventable multimorbidity, or at least multimorbidity where we thought we could work backwards to some of the causes. And I recognize that you're probably not all GPs in the audience. So I better explain some of these cryptic uh, abbreviations. Depression, diabetes, morbid obesity need very little explanation. Morbid obesity is a body mass index greater than 40. Um, chronic pain. That was people who were on opiate prescribing on their GP records. CKD is chronic kidney, kidney disease. CHD is, chronic, is coronary heart disease. SMI, an important one, serious mental illness, which in GP case notes means you've got psychosis, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder. Stroke, AF is atrial fibrillation. HF is heart failure and dementia. So how many of the population had any of this basket of 12 long-term conditions, the multimorbidity basket, if you like? Well, it's only a very small cohort of adults had three or more. That's what we were studying in the end. We focused our study on the 1.7% who had three or more. But out there in the whole population, a fifth of the population 
have one of those long-term conditions, 19%. It's about a fifth of the population. So have a long-term condition, but we're focusing on multimorbidity, so the focus is going to be on those 1.7%. I said we were also going to look at the risk factors. So again, there's a bit of a political decision, there's a bit of a scientific decision, there's a bit of a let's be pragmatic about this, well, what can we actually find in GP case notes? So we had a debate about the, which risk factors to include. In the end, found six risk factors to include, which were hypertension, I raised cholesterol, were you a smoker, were you drinking more than the safe limit of 14 units a week? What was your Q risk score and what was your body mass index? And let me just row back and explain what some of that means. Your Q risk score, Every GP in the audience, I'm afraid, will know instantly what a Q risk score is. It's your cardiovascular disease 10-year risk score calculated based on an algorithm embedded in every single GP computer. It's actually used when you turn up for your NHS health check to stratify you. Do you have a risk in the next 10 years of 10% or 20% or more of having heart disease in the 10 years ahead? That's what your Q risk score is. And the particularly high-risk people are those with a Q-risk score of greater than 20%. More than a one in five chance of the next 10 years of having a stroke or a heart attack. That's what that means. Um, and it's politically controversial because NICE have recently reduced the threshold for intervention to 10%. Thus, at a stroke, medicalizing huge proportions of the otherwise healthy population. Fortunately, that's not the subject of today's presentation. Um, you can immediately see, with the last risk factor, we got ourselves in a bit of a tangle because morbid obesity we've defined as one of the long-term conditions, but obesity ordinaire, just having a body mass index between 30 and 40, uh, that is uh, classified for the purposes of this study as a risk factor. Now, we also looked at those risk factors in the patients who were, remember that 1.7% who had morbid obesity, and we looked at, well, they're a bit different. I don't know if any headlines stand out to you. One big standout difference in those figures is obviously your Q risk score goes sky high. But it's a bit artificial, that, because your Q risk score always goes sky high the minute you've got diabetes. And a lot of the multimorbidity, 1.7%, did have diabetes. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. A big increase is look at the moderate obesity. That really has increased substantially, although Remember again, a small proportion had morbid obesity of the multimorbidity uh, group. So there is a bit of overlap there. Perhaps the big one for me out of this list, the standout figure, is the 19% who continue to smoke who have multimorbidity. They haven't just got one multimorbidity. Well, you probably can't really have one multimorbidity. These are, I've got three of some pretty serious multimorbidities and still 19% smoke. So there's a lot of risk factors there. And my argument would be there's a lot of preventable, treatable risk factors, even once you have acquired uh, multiple long-term condition status. Now, one of the things that we can do with DataNet is Lambeth is divided into 178 <coughs> lower super output areas. And we can map any characteristic that is recorded anon in anonymous data is recorded in the GP case notes. And I'm going to show you now a map, a heat map for Lambeth, looking at this multimorbidity cohort, the 1.7% who've got three or more long-term conditions. So you can see there's quite a few differences. There's quite a few hot spots. I don't intend to go into it, but just to show you, it's very unevenly distributed. And the minute you see something unevenly distributed, you think, aha, maybe there's something preventable going on there. It's not just chance that everybody's getting multimorbidity. There must be some particular factors down the bottom of the borough or in mid parts around Brixton that could be contributing to multimorbidity. I'm here to talk about health inequalities. So let me take you over two health inequalities to do with the acquisition of multimorbidity. And the first is ethnicity. Remember I described ethnicity as only loosely categorised in Lambeth DataNet based largely on self-ascribed ethnicity. So when I use the term black, population and white, I'm referring to what in the census is black and black British, African and Caribbean 
or African Caribbean groups with black, with white, I'm referring to the white British and the white other categories. So they, do, they are used as shorthand terms. So let me turn to the ethnicity slide with all those lovely arrows on. And the green line is the black population. The blue line is the white population. And you can kind of see, if you can kind of read the grid lines, that the black population acquires multimorbidity some 10 years earlier than the white population. Something is happening in the black population. That the impact of multimorbidity is 10 years earlier. And it's a bit less earlier if you're age 50. It's a bit more early. It's a bit of a wider gap if you're aged 80. My next slide shows something very similar is happening on the basis of social deprivation. So we can divide all our patients into quintiles of social deprivation, um, the least deprived and the most deprived quintile. So again, you can look at the gap between the green line here as the most deprived quintile. The orange line is the least deprived quintile. And you end up getting your multimorbidity about 10 years earlier if you live in a deprived area. Now, everyone who has multimorbidity must have taken a journey, because I've said that we define multimorbidity as three or more conditions. So what were you like when you had two conditions? What were you like when you had one condition, the very start of your multimorbidity journey? Is it purely random amongst those 12 conditions where you start? Are they all evenly distributed? They might be number ones, number twos, number threes. No, there seem to be some common starting points. Now, how to display that? I'm going to show you for my next slide a so-called alluvial plot that shows you how people progress from a starter condition to a second condition to a third condition. That is the artwork that we have been producing in our academic department. I have to thank our data analyst, Steve O'Dervaba, for this presentation. And what it shows is that on the right-hand side, you've got all those multimorbidity conditions, and they're all summarised with those uh, different abbreviations, CHD, coronary heart disease, STIA, is stroke and TIA, and so on. I'm going to take you through some of the different journeys but look at the big starter condition. What's the big starter condition on the left-hand side? It seems that diabetes is the biggie, that diabetes is the one that kicks off the journey to multimorbidity. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is where depression fits in, because there's a very big thing happens with multimorbidity, this mix of physical health and mental health. What's the depression story? And I started off this project thinking that depression would be a big starter condition. Your self-care deteriorates, you lapse into obesity and diabetes, and I had put my money on depression being a starter. Actually, it looks like, based on that, and it's the size of the orange bar, the orange bar is much bigger on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side, which means that depression appears much more to be consequence than cause. And I would argue that, as such, depression is less the trigger to multimorbidity, but probably it is something that makes your multimorbidity a lot worse and probably contributed, contributes to rapidity of decline of your multimorbidity. Another one that was of interest was chronic pain. It was of interest because very few other studies include chronic pain, but it's a great data set, and it's got all the prescribing data of all those 320,000 adult patients in DataNet, and we've got all their opiate prescribing, and there's quite a lot of people out there who take opiates, and this was included as one of the 12 long-term conditions, and it is a bit of a starter condition. It seems much more as a second and a third condition, but to be able to track chronic pain across that pathway of acquisition of multimorbidity. I'm now going to change gear slightly and take you over some of the risk factors. And my last slides show you what happens to those risk factors. Remember, we define six different risk factors. I'm not going to take you over grass for all six, but I'm going to show you some that illustrate the sort of social trends out there in the risk factors. And think of those risk factors as probable causes, or at least contributors, to multimorbidity. Now, these figures are going to be slightly different to the ones we've done before, because I, in this graph, I have 
pushed together. I got fed up of that distinction of morbid obesity is a, is a condition and obesity is a risk factor. I've just put it all together to illustrate the levels of obesity out there in the community. Divided it by quintiles, so the dark blue shows the most deprived population in Lambeth, the light blue shows the least deprived in Lambeth. You'll see in a few of these graphs a few irregularities, and you'll think I've got my figures wrong. I promise I haven't got my figures wrong. The reason there's different bumps, levels, on the two 6% and the two 4% is it's 6 point something percent, and I haven't put the decimal points on it. Um, so I have got here... The figures for obesity in the most deprived, there is more obesity in the most deprived population, less obesity in the least deprived. What if we add in ethnicity, there's a big social gradient in the white population, there's very little social gradient in the black population, although the rates are higher in the black population. Let's do the same graphs, and I'm now hope I'm not extending your patience too much because I'm taking the chair's permission to extend by just a minute, I think. Hypertension. Let's look at what happens in hypertension. All three of those graphs. You've got those graphs in your head for what happened with obesity. Out there, again, slightly different figures to what I presented earlier because this time the rate of hypertension is higher. It's higher because I've included those on the hypertension register recognised by GPs as having hypertension plus those out there in the community who've got sustained high blood pressure, which the GPs appear not to have recognised as hypertension, they're not on hypertension drugs and they haven't been coded as hypertension yet, so the community figures are a bit higher. And you can see more hypertension in the black population, a bit of a social gradient in the white population, very little in the black population, where there's quite substantial rates of hypertension. What about depression? Higher rates of depression, at least diagnosed by GPs. This is not a community survey. This is what's on GP computer systems. Higher rates in the white population than the black population. Big social gradient in the white population with the most deprived being diagnosed a lot more commonly with depression than the least deprived. And the last slide is alcohol. Which way do you think alcohol is going to go? How does alcohol affect our different communities? How does alcohol fit with the health inequalities agenda? Let me show you. It's the white population rather than the black population. These figures are quite good. There's pretty comprehensive cover, coverage, so I'm pretty sure we've captured most of the black population and most of the white population here. Much lower rates of, of excess alcohol. This was 14 units plus, remember, um, per week and a definite social gradient, but going in the reverse direction in the white population. Higher rates in the least deprived population in Lambeth. So what conclusions do we draw from this? There are inequalities in risk factors. You've just seen them. There's also inequalities in multimorbidity. And we are now proposing doing further work um, over the next three years, looking at multimorbidity from a different perspective. Not just a list of conditions, but how much does it affect the patient? How much does it affect the healthcare system, so the health economic costs? And can we really prevent multimorbidity? Thank you very much. save a, a wider discussion about what you've presented for later, but are there any quick questions for clarification purposes? Yep. Yeah, really, really interesting. Could you go back to your acquisition sequence slide? Um, just want to make sure I'm under yeah, understanding. So if there's, a, if there's a line connecting the condition on, on the left to the condition on the right, that means there's some kind of line course continuity. Is, yeah, that, that, is that right? That's right. It's a life course continuity. So loads of people with multimorbidity started. I'm just doing it on this screen. Sorry for you over there. If you started with diabetes, where do you go to next? Well, the big, big chunks, I would say, from diabetes, then move to the second was heart disease. Big chunk goes there. Second is chronic kidney disease. And another big chunk goes to chronic pain. Then where do they all go to? Well, I'd say a big chunk here goes to 
you saw CKD could be the second big condition. Actually, it can also be the third big condition and so on. So it's following streams of patients and the thickness of the bar represents the frequency with which people progress through that chart towards the third long-term condition. What's, what's puzzling me though is why there's no uh, doesn't seem to be a continuity of depression because we know from from po population based studies there's a, there's a, a strong life course continuity in in, de in depressive uh, symptoms over the long over the life course. Yes, in um, this is a very very valid point, which is an artifact in my alluvial plot. It looks like an extremely complex wiring diagram if every single strand is included. Uh, so this is filtered according to the biggest streams. So you've highlighted depression. What's the commonest place people go? What's the commonest second multimorbidity if you start with depression? Well, I would say your second commonest is morbid obesity there. And then there's only one stream because it's been edited. The third is diabetes. Heavily edited. If you want to see the unedited version, it will take a while, but we could talk afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for clarification? Yeah. So did everyone hear that that was about uh, physical inactivity and whether that's been taken into account? I wish. This is based on GP records. You are so right to say that that has got to be one of the key determinants of acquisition of many of those multimorbidities and obesity and blood pressure and all sorts of things. It's massively important. What about the mental health agenda? For one year only, it was part of the GP contract measuring physical activity. There was a complete rebellion amongst my GP colleagues about recording GP activity because we were given something called the GPAC, the General Practice Activity Questionnaire, and we ended up only scoring quaff points if we asked each of our Lambeth patients how much gardening they did and how much golf they played, and it suddenly became discredited, and the principle is so important, and the baby's gone out with the bathwater on that one. I don't think GPs will ever capture that data to a satisfactory level that can be put into a study like this. Thanks. Um, let's move on to our second speaker. Um, this is Sasha Mattock, who is going to be talking um, about other people trying to understand, exploring the experiences of people with learning disabilities who also have mental health problems. 